इलास्टिसिटी so today we will uh, discuss the plasticity so in order to start or understand the concept of plasticity we first discuss the theory of linear elasticity the theory of linear elasticity is useful for modeling materials which undergo small deformations and which return to their original configurations upon removal of load as we call that to be the elastic deformation okay means before the yield point okay the deformation that we have is the elastic deformation so when we apply load the material will deform and if we remove the load inside the yield point then the material will regain their initial state elastic deformations are termed reversible as i have explained that elastic deformation is generally recoverable okay the energy expended in deformation is stored as elastic strain energy and is completely recovered upon load removal almost all real materials will undergo some permanent deformation which remains after the removal of load okay but in reality when we apply load there are some sort of permanent deformation that is encountered inside the material okay which is remains there even if we remove the load which with metals significant permanent deformation will usually occur when the stretch reaches some critical value that is that known as yield stress or yield strength that is a material property so the theory of linear elasticity defines that if the load is applied before yield point the material will recover okay the thing is reversible but if the load is applied in such a way that it crosses a critical value that is the yield point for a ductile material then we have a permanent failure or permanent deformation inside the material permanent deformations involve the dissipation of energy that is the energy will be of two type one is that is recoverable elastic strain energy and one that is a permanent set such processes are termed irreversible in the sense that the original state can be achieved only by the expenditure of more energy means if we want to now recover the deformation what we have to do we have to apply some more amount of energy okay in order to remove that permanent deformation and that is done by for example we do annealing okay stress relieving okay so i hope you understand this this concept now classical theory of plasticity grew out of the study of metals in the late 19th century it is concerned with materials which initially deform elastically but which deform plastically upon reaching a yield stress or yield strength means if a material or specifically a ductile material reaches a yield point then after that it has a it suffer permanent deformation in metals and other crystalline materials the occurrence of plastic deformations at the micro scale level is due to the motion of the dislocations and the migration of grain boundaries on the micro level means if we say that what basically the reason of plastic deformation there are two reasons number one due to the motion of dislocation dislocations will move and because of that movement we have the deformation secondly the migration of grain boundaries the grain boundary will move okay 
and you can understand that why it is irrecoverable. The reason is that dislocation when move, it cannot come back to the previous state. Similarly, if the grain is slide over another grain, it's very difficult that it will come back to their original state. That's why those type of deformation are permanent deformations. The deformation of microvoids and the development of micro cracks is also an important cause of plastic deformation. Means because of this dislocation movement and migration of grain boundaries, we have micro cracks produced and micro voids produced inside the material. That is the major cause of permanent deformation. Plasticity theory began with Tresca in 1864 when he undertook an experimental program into the exclusion of metals and published his famous yield criteria that will be discussed later on. Okay, so plasticity theory was firstly uh, described or identified by Tresca when he studied the extrusion process of metals. Okay, so during his study he found that because of dislocation movement and migration of grain boundaries, the microvoids are formed and we have cracks produced or induced inside the material that are non-recoverable, okay, that are permanent inside the material. Further advances with yield criteria and plastic flow rules were made in the years which followed by St. Vinant, Levy, Von Mises, Henke and Prantel. So there are many other scientists who continue the, uh, the working on the plasticity and they develop different type of uh, theories for plastic deformation. Classification of plasticity problems. There are two broad groups of metal plasticity, which are of interest to the engineer and analyst. analyst okay? So let me discuss one by one. Small plastic strains. It involves relatively small plastic strains, often of the same order as the elastic strains. Okay, means we are talking about we have a small deformation. Even the deformation is in plastic grain, even then the deformation is very small. We are talking about uh, that we are near to yield point. Okay, analysis of problems involving small plastic strains allows one to design structures optimally so that they will not fail when in service, but at the same time are not stronger than they really need to be. Means if a structure is reaches yield point and entering the plastic deformation means it has permanent deformation permanent set that is not required in structures or that is a not a desirable property okay so we want to avoid that and this sense plasticity is seen as a material failure means it is a small plastic stains that is material reaches yield point Okay, but for structures, even that point is not acceptable. Okay, so we consider that point to be material failure and it is not a desirable thing. Okay, we want to avoid that. Secondly, we have large plastic strains. The second type of problem involves very large strains and deformations. So large that the elastic strains can be disregarded. Means if we compare the strain that we have in elastic region and if we compare that with the plastic region. So elastic strain can be neglected because that is very small as compared to the plastic strain. These problems occur in the analysis of metals manufacturing and forming processes which can involve extrusion, drawing, forging, rolling etc. In these later type problems a simplified model known as perfectly plastic is usually employed okay the word perfect means that the material in this model does not strain harden that is the yield strength is used which is independent of the amount of plastic strain when the word perfect or perfectly plastic is uh, you know come it simply means that there is no hardening and you know that hardening means the graph is has a slope either it's a straight line or it's a curve the graph is going up with some slope if the graph is a flat line like 
this then there is no strain hardening okay so we call it a perfectly plastic so what actually happens the elastic part is very small so we reach yield point and then the deformation occurs near to yield point okay so whatever we uh, want to uh, you know do for example extrusion rolling forging will do at that particular uh, load okay so this is the uh, main uh, definition of uh, plasticity okay that is uh, the thing that we want to do okay so i hope you understand the two classification first one basically defines the failure second one defines that how we are going to utilize the plastic strains now does plasticity is a desirable property do we want to have plasticity okay the answer of this question is yes in case of metal forming plasticity is needed such as extrusion wire drawing sheet metal forming rolling okay we need plasticity we want to enter inside the plastic region we want want to yield the material so that we can give them a shape in order to give desired shape to a material we need to deform it plastically okay so when we remove the load what happen two two phenomena will occur there is a spring back effect that is the elastic part will recover and there will be a permanent set okay that permanent set is what we need okay to uh, give a shape to a metal for example we have v bending or edge bending see this is v bending okay this is a, she a sheet of metal and we basically uh, apply load on, on that we have a die and after that we got this v bending okay so we want this shape to be a permanent type of uh, deformation okay second example is edge bending this is a plate and this is a die okay so we hit a punch because of that uh, you know uh, hit what happened we have the edge type of bending okay and again if you want to acquire this shape permanently we have to deform it plastically okay i hope you understand uh, you know the concept by this these two examples permanent deformation can only be obtained if material is deformed in plastic region or above yield point else the material regain its initial state during elastic deformation i think i think you understand this point but for structures we don't want any plastic deformation that's why yield point is considered as failure point for structures but for metal forming okay for give shaping a material we need plasticity is a desirable property but for structures the if we enter in the plastic region it's a failure okay so i hope you got the answer of this particular question now there are few assumptions of plasticity theory for basic plasticity theories falling assumptions are usually made so we'll try to discuss each of them one okay and so that we can understand that why basically we have these assumptions number one response is independent of rate effects means whatever the deformation we get is independent of the strain rate okay second material is considered to be incompressible in the plastic range we assume material to be incompressible for example if we are doing plastic deformation the volume remains the same okay there is no washinger effect so we will explain that point also okay the material is isotopic means material remains isotopic but as you can see for example in rolling before uh, the rolling the material can be considered as isotopic but after the rolling we have you know different type of properties in different directions that is the material become an isotopic so we will explain that also yield stress is dependent of hydrostatic pressure and you you know that uh, uh, generally we have a uniaxial test in order to determine the yield stress okay but for example if we assume hydrostatic pressure that is the load is applied from three sides so uh, so we assume that it, this load applied from three side will not affect the yield point of that particular material okay so let's discuss them one by one the first two of these will usually be very good at the approximations the other three may or may not be depending on the material and circumstances that is the response is independent of rate 
the material is incompressible generally the deformation is basically considered to have an incompressible type of effect that is volume remains conserved before and after deformation for example most metals can be regarded as isotropic after large plastic deformation however for example in rolling the material will have become an isotropic there will be distinct material direction and asymmetries okay means the material no more remains symmetric okay and in the rolling direction the property will be different and perpendicular to the rolling direction the property will be different so the assumption is somehow be used for some processes the material is considered to be isotropic but generally uh, it uh, you know it is not considered as the main assumption uh, for specifically for rolling process we found the properties are different in rolling direction and it uh, at 90 degree of the rolling direction okay so material become anisotropic but in order to simplify for few processes we may use the the deformation to be isotropic our material remains isotropic okay now in order to understand the boschinger effect we have to see the figure first now uh, see this red color line okay so what we are talking about for even materials similar strength is observed in tension and compression we are talking about even materials for example ductile materials example mild steel if we load a uh, mild steel under tension we get this type of curve for example okay this is specific type of steel okay and if we deform the same under compression we got this type of strain or this type of strain diagram so if we uh, see the yield point at SET and here also, also SEC generally under compression and tension these are generally occur at the same type uh, same point okay yielding occur generally at the same point similarly uh, the, uh, the the theta or the Young's modulus is same under tension and compression okay or uh, almost have the similar values so that material is known as even material okay so under tension is above okay and uh, under compression is at the uh, this uh, third coordinate okay that you can see but if one takes a new sample and loads it in tension till plastic reach means if you took a material okay and uh, apply load under tension such that you cross yield point that is a point and enter in somewhere in the plastic region b point okay then unloads then you unload so when you unload you know that you will follow the same slope and reach that point x axis okay and continues applying load under compression then what you have done on the same material what you did you apply the compressive load so you'll get this blue curve okay so again i'm repeating this point you load the sample okay or specimen under tension you enter in the plastic region means you go beyond the yield point at b point and then at b point you unload the part and you reach the zero load and then you apply the compressive load on the material so you get this blue curve okay that is you can see here so now what happened one finds that the yield strength in compression is not the same as the yield strength in tension you can see the yield strength here at a and now is decreased okay as it would have been if the specimen had not first been loaded in tension so if you can see that a point and here f point are almost similar so if we take a new specimen and load it dead under tension and then take a new specimen and load it dead and the compression so we have similar yield point but if we take a sample and load it under tension and enter in the plastic region and then unload and then apply the compressive load on the same part okay that was uh, tested under tension so we found that the curve will be different and yield point will be different and the behavior of the material will be different okay in fact the yield point in this case will be significantly less than the corresponding yield stress in compression for fresh specimen this reduction in yield stress is known as the boschinger effect so i hope you understood the idea 
in simple words if we take a specimen and we apply tensile load so we get yield point and if we take a new sample and apply the compressive load we get the yield point generally these yield point or deformation are generally the same for even material but now if we take another specimen and we apply the tensile load and enter in the plastic region then unload and then apply the compressive load on that deformed uh, material so we found that the yield strength values has been decreased okay and this phenomena of reduction of strength is known as Boschinger effect okay because it was uh, studied by Boschinger so I hope you understand the Boschinger effect in order to exemplify the, the, the state two approximations are made namely isotopic hardening and kinematic hardening so further uh, to further understand the concept though so these basically uh, hardening processes are classified as isotopic and kinematic hardening the solid line depicts the response of a real material you know we load under tension we enter in the plastic region we unload and then we reach this curve that is a solid line okay the solid black line the dotted lines are two extreme cases of hardening which are used in plasticity model so now you know this solid black line there is no mathematical model no analytical equation uh, you know till date is present that can define you gives you this curve okay so we cannot get this line okay we can approximate it by some assumptions but for different materials this curve cannot be uh, you know uh, cannot be drawn without the experiments okay so there is no the uh, theoretical explanation for that so in order to simplify this effect people has done two assumptions they said either take kinematic hardening or isotopic hardening okay for the first is the isotopic hardening model in which the yield stress in tension and compression are maintained equal that can be seen in the above figure so what we assume in isotopic hardening we said that yield point in this scenario is same as under tension as well as compression and but you know that yield strength will decrease okay but we are assuming it to be the same okay so it will give us some definite value of hardening okay so this is known as isotopic hardening the second being kinematic hardening in which the total elastic range is maintained constant throughout the deformation for the second assumption kinematic hardening we assume that the elastic deformation or elastic range remains same okay so this can we can identify from the elastic strain okay and then we can equate that with the uh, with this dotted line so we can exemplify the kinematic hardening as well so these are the two assumptions kinematic hardening isotopic hardening why we are assuming these two hardening because we cannot determine theoretically theoretically, theoretically these actual uh, behavior of the material okay the presence of the Boschinger effect complicates any plasticity theory so generally this effect is not considered while studying the plasticity so Boschinger effect is there but we are not considering the Boschinger effect now the understanding that what what basically happened why the strength goes on decreasing you know when we load a material uh, uh, till yield point and go beyond the yield point so what happened uh, we have the permanent deformation permanent set okay and by entering in the plastic region we know that strength will increase so when we unload the material what happened the elastic part will recover okay but the permanent set will there that ultimately have increased the strength so in strength is already increased means that residual stresses are present inside the material so now if we apply the load compressive load in that material it will uh, you know deform uh, earlier okay or it will break earlier it will enter earlier in the uh, the plastic region okay so the region of that is the strain hardening that is occur in the tension and this phenomena can be vice versa for example we can first load the material under compression then unload then load it in the tension okay or the the, the vice versa condition is we first load in the tension then unload then load in the compression okay so what we found we found that strength will be different okay and this is known as Boschinger effect so i hope you understand 
the concept of Washinger effect, but generally, in order to simplify the plasticity theory, what we do, we neglect or ignore these uh, effects, okay? Or either we assume kinematic hardening or isotopic hardening. Now, together with these assumptions, together with these assumptions can be made on the type of hardening and on whether elastic deformation are significant. Okay, we can also assume that the hardening, what should be the hardening rule and whether we should include the deformation, uh, elastic deformation or not. For example, consider the hierarchy of models illustrated in the figure below, commonly used in theoretical analysis. In A, both the elastic and plastic curves are assumed linear. That you see, here we have first the elastic part and then we have the strain hardening part. Here we have the elastic part, then we have the strain hardening, uh, so, uh, the, the perfectly plastic part. Okay. So, in both the curves, the elastic and plastic curves are assumed linear. And you know that elastic part is generally linear, but plastic part is non-linear. But we assume it in order to simplify, we assume it to be a linear. So, this model, we have linear elastic and linear plastic model. Okay, or we call it linear elastic and a linear hardening model because we have hardening okay and the effect is linear second we can say elastic okay because we have elastic linear elastic and perfectly plastic because why we call it perfectly plastic because the deformation of permanent deformation when we reach yield point so we stop uh, at particular point and at that uh, you know same similar uh, load we basically deform okay so it is linear elastic and perfectly plastic model in b work hardening is neglected work hardening is basically strain hardening or simply hardening and the yield stage is constant after initial yield so here yield point is constant and we deform at the yield point so uh, such perfectly plastic models are particularly appropriate for studying processes where metal is worked at a high temperature such as hot rolling where work hardening is small okay so uh, what we'll do when we have a hot rolling or hot working so there what we uh, assume we assume that we reach the uh, plastic po uh, point that is yield point and then we deform at the same load okay so i hope you understand these two uh, material models that we generally use uh, in plasticity theory okay in many areas of application the strains involved are large that is in metal working processes like extrusion rolling or drawing where up to 50 percent reduction ratios are common okay and, and you know by experience we have studied in different uh, subjects that metal forming that rolling uh, we know by rolling or by extrusion by other process we can reduce the thicknesses by 50 percent so, in such cases, the elastic stains can be neglected altogether as in two models C and D. So, generally, we have large plastic deformation and elastic uh, deformation is very small. It is very small that generally we ignore the elastic deformation part. Okay. So, that can be seen in C and D. Here, you can see that there is no elastic stain. Here also, there is no elastic stain. It, it does not uh, mean that we don't have any elastic strain. Elastic strain is there, but the magnitude is that much small that we ignore those strains. Okay. So, when we ignore the elastic strain, we call that a rigid material model. Okay. Rigid does not mean that it has no deformation. Rigid means they are rigid in terms of elastic strain. That elastic strain is very small that we can assume it to be rigid and linear hardening or rigid and perfectly plastic okay linear hardening means we have hardening and rigid means there is elastic effect is negligible so the rigid perfectly plastic model d is the crudest of all and hence in many ways the most useful we generally use rigid perfectly plastic because elastic strain is negligible secondly at high temperature generally we do the cold working at high temperatures okay so at high temperatures we just reach yield point and then we do the deformation at constant load it is widely used in analyzing metal forming processes in the design of steel structures so out of those 
four we generally use rigid perfectly plastic material model that is an assumption because in reality we don't have a straight line we have linear elastic region and we have non linear plastic region okay so i hope you understand uh, the concept the assumption so generalized plasticity model stress and strain are related through sigma is equal to e epsilon in the elastic region that is known as hooke's law e being the young's modulus now the tangent modulus k is the slope of the stress strain curve in the plastic region now we see this is the non linear actual curve okay so what we did we approximate that by tangent modulus k that is the slope of the stress strain curve in the plastic region and in general change uh, during a deformation uh, at any instant of strain the increment in stress d sigma is related to the increment in strain d epsilon through d sigma is equal to k times d epsilon so we can correlate this plastic if only in a deformation by d sigma is equal to k d epsilon okay so this is one type of generalized plasticity model okay because you can see that this is the real curve we have linear elastic region and non linear plastic region so in order to exemplify we cannot have any particular equation for this non linear curve so what we assume we assume a straight line in a tangent modulus k and we relate strain and stress by using this tangent modulus so this is basically a generalized plasticity model okay because for different materials the equation of the curve is different and it's very difficult to uh, determine the equation because it changes material to material very material to material so we approximate that curve by tangent modulus and assume it to be a straight line in the plastic region so this is the uh, simplest material model okay that we have and we have explained uh, discussed four material models that is rigid perfectly plastic it is the extension of the similar type of uh, material model now perfectly plastic deformation behavior plastic deformation does not change volume okay it's one of the uh, uh, approximation also and practically we found the change in the volume is not that much so for a metal under uniaxial stress the two transverse plastic strains are equal because since we have three dimensions for example the length is increased and the cross section in terms of x and y will decrease so related to the longitudinal plastic strains as derived as follows so what we do we will try to understand that what happened to the strains in three dimensions okay that is x y and z x y being the cross section and z will be the length okay mathematically using volume consistency vf is equal to v not final volume is equal to initial volume initial volume I assume the material to be a, a cubic element so the final thickness final width and final length is equal to the initial thickness initial width and initial length so after deformation the volume remains same okay also we know that strain is equal to change in length of original length that is lf minus l not upon l not so if we do lcm break and simplify we get strain is equal to lf upon l not minus 1 and this lf upon l not is stretch or we can simply write the formula for stretch to be epsilon plus 1 strain plus 1 okay now if we divide the final volume with initial volume okay what we get we get lf upon l not wf upon w not tf upon t not is equal to 1 so we know that this will be the stretch in length the stretch in width stretch in thickness okay and we know that lambda can be substituted by epsilon plus 1 so we can simply replace these with epsilon x plus p for plasticity plus 1 using the same formula epsilon y p plus 1 in width direction epsilon z p plus 1 for let's say length direction okay so we have these three strains or stretches should be equal to 1 okay now if we multiply these three uh, you know uh, brackets and ignore the higher power because strain is small so higher power will be uh, can be neglected and simplify what we get we get a, a strain in x plus strain in y and strain in z is equal to 0 that is we are talking about the plastic strain 
the plastic strain sum of the strains should be equal to zero and we know that the cross section is we take a cube or a square cross section so whatever the strain in x similar will be have in y okay so if we take epsilon x and epsilon y to be the same so we can simplify this equation further and we can simply write x, uh, that this become 2 and if we solve for epsilon uh, you know z so we got epsilon x plastic region is equal to epsilon y in plastic region is equal to minus epsilon z in plastic region divided by 2 so the strain in x and y is the half in this z okay so this is for perfectly plastic deformation behavior this is the uh, mathematical expression in terms of strain or the condition okay i hope you understand that okay in applications like metal forming the plastic strain is so large that elastic strain is negligible thus we may neglect elastic strain and identify the net strain entirely with plastic strain in rigid perfectly plastic model okay so we have explained that earlier also so when the stress is within the yield strength the material is rigid and the strain does not change even though metal is capable of arbitrarily large deformation in many situations the plastic strain is small on the order of elastic strain so what we are assuming that we have the rigid means elastic strain is negligible but even then the plastic strain is very small okay for example the plastic deformation of the metal can be co constrained by elastic surroundings when plastic strain and elastic strain are comparable we need to include both in the model model so this model is called elastic perfectly plastic model the net strain is the sum of the elastic strain and the plastic strain so if we see the total strain and if you want to incorporate the elastic part also because we assume that elastic part is significant as compared to the plastic part so the total strain will be elastic plus plastic so it is one of the assumption of the material model of actual material model of, of plasticity so generally when we study the plasticity material model we assume elastic plus plastic strains okay now strain hardening in the flow rule a work hardening also known as strain hardening or cold working is the strengthening of a metal by plastic deformation so what actually it says that when we load up uh, any material under tension or compression and we cross the yield point enter in the plastic region so we have the permanent set elastic part will recover and there is a permanent deformation so their permanent deformation basically increase the strength of the material this strengthening occurs because of dislocation movements and dislocation generations within the crystal structure of the material that I have already explained. Okay. Now, assume this rolling process, for example, okay, we have the metal uh, uh, sheet entering and uh, uh, pass, after passing through the rollers, we have the detection in the thickness. Okay. So, when this metal forming occurs, you can see that we do that in plastic region. So whenever you enter in the plastic region and deform, you have strain hardening. Okay. So this is the graph that explains that. So initially we started with this point and we reach the yield point and we enter in the plastic region and then we apply in the load. And after one pass, okay, what happened? It thickness will reduce and there is a small spring back effect that it will come back, elastic part will recover. Then when we go to the second pass, the material is already strain hardened. Okay. Why? because we have deformed that and in the plastic region okay many metals with a reasonably high melting point as well as several polymers can be strengthened in this fashion okay dislocations on intersecting slip planes permit both elastic interactions and dislocation reactions to contribute to work hardening okay so when we uh, enter in the plastic region because of the migration of uh, the grain boundaries as well as the uh, dislocation movements okay the strength is basically increased okay stress chain curve in the region of uniform plastic deformation does not increase proportionally with the strain the material is set to work harder okay i hope this is clear so we have explained this point flow plasticity is a solid mechanics theory that is used to describe the plastic behavior of materials 
okay now if we see flow plasticity so it's a theory that we use for defining the uh, plastic behavior of a metals okay or materials flow plasticity uh, plasticity theories are characterized by the assumption that a flow rule exists that can be used to determine the amount of plastic deformation in the material in flow plasticity theories it is assumed that the total strain in a body can be decomposed additively into an elastic part and a plastic part okay so basically the theory says that we have two type of deformations elastic and plastic so we can divide that uh, total strain into elastic and plastic part flow rule is defined as the mathematical equation that governs the plasticity that is a mathematical equation that basically discuss or defines the uh, the plastic region there are many relationship for the flow rule proposed by different scientists but unfortunately not a single flow rule is present that work for all materials under plastic deformation we there we have multiple flow rules but not a single definite flow rule that is applicable for all the materials okay acha does work hardening is done at room temperature work hardening is generally done under cold work or hot work environment in cold working environment the temperature is maintained between 0.3 to 0.5 times the transition temperature while for hot working environment the temperature ranges from 0.5 to 0.8 times the transition temperature means hot working or cold working are done generally at higher temperature okay but for very soft ductile materials like aluminium extrusion is done at room temperature as we can we can see in the windows panels you see the aluminium windows or the panels the extrusion is done at the room temperature the reason of deforming at room temperature is that the application is not critical or does not required structural integrity because that part will not have so much amount of load and it's not a critical part okay so by doing the deformation at room temperature create some sort of cracks produce some cracks but even then the material or the application is not critical so it is acceptable also deforming at room temperature will not stain harden to large extent that resulted in brittle sort of failure like cracking also like uh, aluminum is very soft or ductile so if we deform that at room temperature okay or uh, do give it the shape at room temperature what happened it will not uh, you know have more, higher amount of stain hardening okay so the cracks are there but that are very small cracks okay that can be ignored because the part is not used uh, in uh, you know critical uh, uh, in a structures so generally we are not doing at room temperature but yes for very soft material and the if the application is not critical then we can uh, uh, do the uh, you know stain hardening at room temperature also so what are the benefit that we obtain while working uh, work hardening under cold or hot environment so what are the benefits work hardening under cold or hot environment will, will result in less load requirement for deformation because if we increase the temperature the yield point decreases and we need less load to deform that part okay so because by heating the yield point value is decreased and material will plastically deform at lesser load also this will also reduce the capacity of equipment required like loading hammers motors etc so when the load is required uh, load requirement is decreased so the capacity of the equipment to deform that is reduced okay secondly it will avoid the failure due to strain hardening stress relieving will be done due to temperature and material won't get stain hardened okay for example you see all the process rolling extrusion wire drawing all of them will be done at higher temperature the reason is that at higher temperature what happen it will not get stain hardened so whatever the stress generate generate will be relieved because of the temperature so yes the stain hardening effect will be there but very small as compared to if we have uh, con conducted that stain hardening at room temperature also metal forming is done in multiple passes to reduce stain hardening effect okay. also you know we are not uh, doing this metal forming in one go we have multiple passes so why we have multiple passes because if we apply uh, more, deform it more in one go the stain hardening will be more okay so because it, uh, and it may uh, produce cracks okay inside the material so that's why we are doing at high temperature 
and at in multiple passes. On the other hand, if the metal forming is done at room temperature, it will strain hard in the material. This might result in failure because of the form formation of micro cracks. This material cannot be used in structural applications, okay, or critical applications because we have done at room temperature, which so we cannot see when I can die, but there are some cracks. And if we use that in the structural application, that it, the, the part or material will fail from that uh, you know point. Okay. Empirical relationships attributed to ludic and hollow man can be used to describe the shape of plastic stress strain curve. So there are different flow rules. One of them is ludic and hollow man. It has general form sigma is equal to kh epsilon n or sigma is equal to sigma y plus kl epsilon n. Where sigma is the stress, sigma y is the yield stress, epsilon is the strain, kh and kl are different strength coefficients and n is the strain hardening exponent. Okay, so this is the material model or flow rule uh, that is given by Ludic and Holloman. Okay, now here n is equal to 0 for perfectly plastic solids, n is equal to 1 for perfectly elastic solids and for n is equal to 0.1 to 0.5 for most of the metals. Okay, so this is one example of flow rule. Okay. Secondly, another flow equation known as Ramberg Osgood law works up to ultimate tensile strength is given by this expression. The total strain will be sigma upon E plus KRO sigma upon E NRO that is equal to sigma upon E plus alpha uh, sigma naught upon E upon sigma upon uh, sigma naught NRO. Okay. Where KRO is the Ramberg Osgood strength coefficient, it's a constant or coefficient. NRO is Ramberg Osgood strain hardening coefficient as we have N, so here we have NRO. Sigma naught is the offset yield stress. E is the Young's modulus and alpha is KRO, means we have simplified this expression as alpha. So this is these are the two examples for the flow rules, and you can see the flow rules are not that simple for different materials and for uh, you know, we have different type of curves so it's very difficult to predict so these are just two examples of flow rule that we have now moving towards the last topic viscoelastic and viscoplastic behavior materials having rate dependent deformations are commonly known as viscoelastic material although the viscoelastic materials can suffer irrecoverable deformations they do not have any critical yield or threshold stress mean it's not a constant value which is a characteristic property of the plastic behavior. So means it, it can deform, but the value of critical yield is different because it depended on the strain rate. In many forming processes, the deformation rates are small enough to consider the material behavior to be independent of a strain rate and to use an elastoplastic material model. So we have, you know, sometimes the strain rate is very small, okay, so that we can, uh, you know, use a material elastoplastic material model, okay. Generally, viscoelastic materials are having the time dependent deformation. If you increase the strain rate, the deformation will be different. If you reduce the strain rate, the deformation will be different. So, this is the reason that when we do tensile testing, compression testing, or all type of tests, we have to maintain uh, the uh, strain rate in a range that is a defined range. Okay. For high strain rate, this assumption leads to faulty results. So, if you take high strain rates mean for example if you apply the load for example the load low strain rate we apply slowly and high uh, strain rate means for example impact load and you can see the the effect of impact load is totally different okay now in a tensile test the yield stress is seen to increase with higher strain rates now for example if we test a similar material at different strain rates so what happened the yield point you can see for the first, second and third and the strain rate is increasing like that. So yield point is going on increasing and the curve shifted upward when you increase the strain rate. Okay, that's why we have a range that is defined for tensile testing. So here you can see that by increasing the strain rate, the yield point will increase and the curve shifted upward. Poly polymers and certain alloys show softening behavior immediately after reaching the yield point. At larger strains, the softening is followed by hardening. So, let's see this figure. Here we have 
you know elastic point and then we have yield point yield point is generally constant constant in these type of materials but if you see the strain rate is increasing upward so what happened if we have the strain softening what is uh, sorry stress softening a stress softening is whenever in a stress chain curve the stress goes on decreasing from particular level if the stress decreased that is known as stress softening so here you can see that if the strain rate is more okay we have less stress softening if the strain rate is less we have the largest stress softening as can be seen in this uh, the last the, the, the this third curve okay in the third curve when the strain rate is small we have more strain, stress softening if we increase st uh, the strain rate the stress softening effect will decrease and for larger strain rate the stress softening is further decrease so if you going on increasing the strain rate maybe the stress softening effect will become zero okay so how you define this curve that by increasing the strain rate that we have less stress softening occurring inside the material and how we define stress softening if the stress is dropped suddenly in a stress chain curve that is known as stress softening behavior okay so with this we uh, you know end up the first part of plasticity so in the next part we will discuss the plasticity theory and few numericals okay on 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 plasticity so till now till that point okay uh, allah is so see you in the next video inshallah